Hello, I'm Karen Pascal. I'm the Executive Director of the Henry Nouwen Society. Welcome to a new episode of Henry Nouwen, Now and Then. Our goal at the Henry Nouwen Society is to extend the rich spiritual legacy of Henry Nouwen to audiences around the world. Our very special guest today is Sister Sue Mosteller. Recently, Sister Sue was awarded the Order of Canada. This is the top honor for Canadians. The citation reads, for her dedication to improving the lives of people with intellectual disabilities and for her decades of work as a leader of L'Arche. Sue is a member of the Sisters of St. Joseph, but I know her best as the executrix of Henry Nouwen's literary estate. Henry and Sue were good friends, a friendship that was built in the last 10 years of Henry Nouwen's life when they were both living and serving at the L'Arche Daybreak community north of Toronto. I asked Sister Sue what her favorite Nowen book is, and she chose Adam, God's Beloved. I invite you to listen to our conversation, and you'll learn why this book is such a profound revelation of God's character. I am so glad to have an opportunity to talk with you, Sue. You are one of my heroes. I have known you for many, many years (laughs) and loved you dearly. You're a wonderful, wonderful person. When I when I said Adam, Sue, what book shall we talk about? You said Adam, God's Beloved. (laughs) And really, Adam, God's Beloved, tells the story of Henry coming to L'Arche and what was going on. And it's it's rich. It's really an incredible book. Um, Tell us a little bit about the relationship. What what was Henry thrown into when he arrived at L'Arche? What was he asked to do? We asked him uh, to help us make connections uh, for the core members with the various churches and the synagogues and so on, because we knew that uh, we couldn't, like we, our business was really to take care of people, and we couldn't, we couldn't find the way to do this, and also nobody knew how, and so uh, we just said maybe you could visit the churches around here. We have people in the Presbyterian Church, the Anglican Church, the Catholic Church, and so on, and talk to the pastors and so on. So Henry began to do that and then to invite them for worship. And uh, they would come and lead a worship service on Friday night. We always had a worship service. And uh, he connected us with a couple of different uh, um, Christian communities, uh, churches, and he also lined us up with a a little um, synagogue, and uh, he connected with the father of the woman in the Islamic tradition, who was a teacher, a high school teacher, and just very, very steeped in the Hindu scriptures and so on. And so we began to invite these people to come and to talk to us about their tradition. And Henry would always talk to us beforehand, saying, you know, you have a tradition, you love your tradition, it's so important to you, but be open, because other people God has called in different ways, and God is bigger than one church. God could be God for people of all different backgrounds and traditions, and so let's see how our diversity becomes a real gift for us. So it was like a whole education for the first couple of years, and we met all these beautiful people, and and our people were able to go, and then one of the Jewish fellows, his father was 84 years old and had always wanted his son to make his bar mitzvah, but had never been accepted because he was handicapped. And this little synagogue said, no, no, we'll we'll help him and we'll bring him along. And so Henry was helping him and going, they went together with the father and he prepared. And then they invited all of us, the whole community of Daybreak, which by that time was about 60 or 70 people. And we all went for the bar mitzvah celebration and they just stopped after every 10 minutes to say, we have to stop and explain to our Christian brothers and sisters what we're doing. So this ceremony went on and on and then we were all invited for lunch and so on, but really just bringing us together, bringing us together in, in hope and in joy and, and in celebration. So this is this is what we asked him to do, and that's what he did. And he also he celebrated the Eucharist every day for whoever wanted to go. And sometimes it was a very small group, and sometimes it was larger. And then on Sundays he participated in the local Catholic church, and he celebrated there. 
and uh, so that he was, we weren't sort of having our own church. We wanted to be connected with the churches in Richmond Hill. Well, it's interesting because Henry was a Catholic priest, but there was a, such a bigness, such a largeness, That's right. such a welcome That's right. there to Huge. everyone. And, and, um, and I think we see that in the books. And I think uh, in the books he's written, what I find is they are so Christocentric. They are. Yes. That's in the center, but they are so welcoming. They don't have these yeah, big lines up of you're in or you're out or whatever. And I think it's because really for Henry, he was just finding out the truth of how much God loved him. And then he just wanted to be sure he passed that on to others. But he, he faced an enormous challenge when he came. I mean, he arrived, uh, as I recall, with truckloads of... of <laughs> supplies shall we say he all his belongings all his books everything and actually he was about to be put up in a little tiny room and uh what did you do with this man who had you know he was he was a man of the world but what did you do with him so it we we he he told us i'm coming on this day and we said fine we'll be ready for you and uh so uh first of all a moving van drove in the driveway and then 24 cars (laughs) <laughs> and uh, all his friends drove from, from um, I guess, New Haven or someplace in Connecticut, and they all drove with him, and um, they all wanted to see where he was going and see daybreak, and, and he expected them all to stay for dinner. They arrived about 3 o'clock. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, again, like, this was this little potato patch up in Richmond Hill, and this group arrived and just knocked us off our feet, you know, and we were scrambling like everything. But um, that was kind of the, the, and he said, I brought all my belongings because I, I don't need them anymore, so you can have them. Oh. <laughs> so we had a moving van full of furniture and so on. It was really, really funny. Oh. And uh, so that was his arrival. And uh, then the people all went back and, uh, and we settled in. And uh, Henry had a little room in the basement of the, one of the homes uh where people with disabilities lived <clears throat> and uh we and he had an office and uh it, it down at another building and so on so he got himself settled in and we were we had a little house at the back of the property where where a, a farm family had lived and so uh they had just moved and we uh, put all the furniture in that house and furnished the whole house with Henry's furnishing now you you didn't just let you had the great Henry Nowen, writer, uh, professor, whatever, and uh, you assigned him a job right off the bat that would become life changing for him. Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, he came and uh, settled in, and Joe Egan was the director at that time of Daybreak, and um, Joe was a real really he could read people quite well, I think. And we knew, like, that Henry had just enormous gifts and everything. And we knew that he had a million friends. And Joe was very, um, I think, discreet in wanting to get him rooted in the community. And that's why he said he doesn't have to live in the home forever. But he needs to live in the home so that, like other assistants who come, his formation in Larsh is in the home and it isn't by us telling him about it and um, so they invited him to live in the home where he lived with people he had his meals with them they had their uh, little community meetings at which he was expected to attend and uh, so on and um, then Joe asked him if he would give a certain number of hours in the home just with the with the people helping with the routines again to get r- into the life of the community to really be formed in Larsh, and this is who we are and what we do and how we live. And Henry was very agreeable to that, and uh, he said it doesn't have to go on forever, but it's it's a, it's what we would call a formation period. So he asked Henry to help with Adam's routine in the morning. And Henry explains that quite well in the book uh, about uh, what happened to him when he was asked that because Adam was very, very handicapped. He was a man who couldn't walk on his own. He couldn't speak. 
and uh, he everything needed to be done for him. Really, he needed help with dressing and bathing and uh, getting ready for bed and eating, and uh, so it was a, a huge shift for Henry to move from teaching and being at the front of the classroom to uh, sitting with Adam and waiting for him to take the next spoonful of food. Wow. Henry was, he was uh, geared to fast motion and one thing to the other and thinking everything through and so on. And (laughs) this was, this was really, uh, and he was also very, very scared because uh, Adam couldn't tell him. He said, I was always afraid that I might hurt him. And uh, that he wouldn't be able to tell me. And that's true that Adam had been hurt in the past and wasn't able to tell people, you know, that something was wrong. So um, so it was delicate. But uh, the assistants were wonderful. They were all just younger than Henry. And um, they loved him. And they just uh, said, call us anytime. We're here to help you. You don't have to. You don't have to struggle so much. Just call us and we'll be with you. And so that's what he said. I was always calling from the room. Help me. I don't I don't know what to do. Yeah. But uh, it was a it was a routine that took about two hours to get Adam up in the morning to get him bathed and get him dressed and get him in his wheelchair and get him his breakfast and then feed him his breakfast and then get him washed up and in his wheelchair and back and back to his day program. It took about two hours. And of course, Henry, when he, his feet hit the floor in the morning, he was ready to go. <laughs> he just ran all day from one thing to the other, from one person to the other. And this was like, I don't know, it was like the stoppage of <laughs> the Titanic or something. I mean, he just had to stop and uh, wait. And it was dry, drove him crazy, but it was uh, marvelous because in that something was happening to Henry, which he describes so well in the book. It's interesting because in the book, as I read it, you get the feeling of Henry's, some of Henry's friends coming and going, why are you wasting your time on this? You're this right. brilliant mind. You're this brilliant teacher. You're this brilliant writer. And here yeah. you are caring yeah. for somebody who can't even read one of your books uh, but it was it, it's such an interesting book because there's a great deal of honesty in it. It's like this book helps me understand how L'Arche was the perfect place for Henry to come at that time in his life. And it was a safe place because in the process of this very hard task for Henry, he, in a way, was exposed at a very deep level. And... Um, began to receive something from Adam. You know, um, what was going on? Does everybody receive something from somebody with that extreme a disability? Or what was happening that you could see happening there? Well, certainly I I couldn't see it at the time, but uh, I can reflect back. And I, I have the impression that Henry had been recognized for his very, very, I would say, very acute intelligence and spirituality and his knowledge and his ability to read people. He he had been really very, very acknowledged for that all his life. And possibly he wasn't um, acknowledged at the level of his heart as much. But I think this man was gifted both with a very keen intelligence and a tremendously sensitive heart. And I think that his his suffering, which he also describes in the book, his loneliness, his anxieties, his uh, those things were related because his heart, I mean, he had to be very careful as a priest and he had, and a gay man as well. He had to be very careful and, um, he he had to sort of shine where he could shine, but he couldn't shine at the level of the heart too much and couldn't expose that. And I have a feeling that this stopping and just with this very, very gentle and quiet and caring and loving man uh, did something that began to reach Henry at the level of his heart 
and began to help them to explore sort of those desires, not as terrible things that he should be afraid of and run away from, but that he was made to love and he was lovable. And that the things that he was yearning for, he was receiving from this beautiful, beautiful soul who was there in front of him with so much peace and gentleness and kindness and uh, just receiving, receiving. And, and, it, and Henry was just pouring himself out for Adam. He would do anything for Adam because of Adam's loving reception of him. And it was all so safe. I read this passage in the book that I thought was really wonderful. He said, he simply lived and by his life invited me to receive his unique gift, wrapped in weakness, but given for my transformation. While I tended to worry about what I did and how much I, my, how much I could produce, Adam was announcing to me that being is more important than doing. While I was pre- preoccupied with the way I was talked about or written about, Adam was quietly telling me that God's love is more important than the praise of people. While I was concerned about my individual accomplishments, Adam was reminding me that doing things together is more important than doing things alone. Adam couldn't produce anything, had no fame to be proud of, couldn't brag of any award or trophy, but by his very life, he was the most radical witness to the truth of our lives that I have ever encountered. That's the other wonderful thing, that Henry was able to put words around that experience that nobody else, I don't think, could put around. I mean, those words are just so telling. And um, they're, they're, you have to read it a couple of times to really get it. Mm. And when he said, Adam was my friend, my teacher, and my guide, and you just say, well, like, this guy didn't talk. He didn't, he didn't do anything. He never led you any place. Yeah, he did. He led Henry right to his heart and to the fact that his heart was beautiful and safe and that he was allowed to love because he was himself beloved, you know. It's interesting. I, I, I found myself, I had exactly that reaction. When I finished the book, I wanted to go back and start all over again. I felt like it was peeling away at my heart because it was really challenging me in ways that, you know, like Henry, I can be completely caught up in performing and doing things and accomplishing things. And the encounter with Adam was really something that brought him down to the core of what is this all about? What does it mean to be beloved? He wrote, I was going through the deep human struggle to believe in my belovedness, even when I had nothing to be proud of. Yes, I had left university with its prestige, but this life gave me satisfaction, even brought me admiration. Yes, I was considered good, even no, a noble person because I was helping the poor. But now that the last crutch had been taken away, I was challenged to believe that even when I had nothing to show for myself, I was still God's beloved son. I find this book just really opens up who Henry is at the heart and, and in a sense exposes the very vulnerable core of, of Henry. And I, I think I, I, I see in the book too wonderful story of Adam, but a wonderful story that allows me to understand how did Henry feel safe enough at L'Arche in a sense to really break and to really go to a very low place and ultimately find that he himself was beloved no matter what. You had a part to play in that, Sue. Tell me a bit about that. Well, you know, we were friends, and so it's very hard for me to say that I had a part to play because we uh, we had met each other, we had talked about things that were important to us, but um, I, I was just there. I happened to be there, and, uh, you know, we were a bit older than most of the people. Uh, I would say we had, we had had other experiences. Most of the assistants were young people who were coming, and many of the core people were young. And so uh, there was this this uh, kind of friendship. We were both interested in things of the spiritual nature, and uh, so we were able to talk about that. And um, Henry supported me a great deal, 
but I think I was able to support him as well. And so uh, we were allowed to talk these things over when we had a chance to visit and, and do. And uh, so that's what happened. I can't basically say much more because I don't know, uh, except that, uh, yeah, I just uh, wanted to try to encourage him. And you could just see that something was happening. Uh, you could you could just see him sort of calming down mm-hmm. and uh, becoming more contented to be who he was. And uh, that was really wonderful to watch. You played a very important part in getting this book finished because this, let's skip forward. Uh, after 10 years at L'Arche Daybreak, Henry was sent on sabbatical and he was going to have the year off to write. And he put this as one of the books he wanted to write. He wanted to tell Adam's story, Adam, God's Beloved. So that was one of his writing jobs when he went on sabbatical. Were you surprised he wanted to write a book about this? I was not only surprised, but I was telling him that I didn't think it was good to do it so soon. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I I just, you know, we were grieving. Uh, Adam had lived with us for 10 years, and this was not long after Adam's funeral that that this happened. And... and, um, Henry was on sabbatical. He was uh, he was on sabbatical when Adam died, and so it was, uh, I guess, uh, challenging for me that he just went ahead anyway uh, and started to write. And as he says in the book, I wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. He just he was compelled, and of course, thankfully, he did because eight months after Adam died, Henry died suddenly, and so had he not done it. It wouldn't have been done. Well, he hadn't quite done it. You had you ended up with this enormous task that the book was there but not quite finished. What was it like for you? Because there was a deadline coming up in November. Henry died September 21st. There is a publishing deadline in November. And you had been named Henry's uh, literary executrix. It was in your hands. What did you do? How did you do it? Well, the first thing is that uh, when when Henry died in September of that year, again uh, it was a surprise. It it was, and he was in Europe, so uh, it was it was terrible. I mean, it was really hard because he was on sabbatical. He was far away, and we just got news that he had had a heart attack, and then a few days later that he had died, and um, and so. Uh, they called us on this Saturday morning saying that Henry had died. And they said, we need the will. We need something out of the will to see where he wants to be buried or something like that. And so we went to the office and we looked through and we found his will. And uh, as we were going through the will to look for what they were asking us, I saw my name. And I thought, oh, that's nice. Henry left me something. So that was very kind. And uh, But I didn't know what it was, so I just went on and, and everything. Then I forgot about it. And and then later when we were going over the will, uh, no, then then the funeral was happening. It, they had they had a funeral in Europe, and then they had a funeral in, in uh, Daybreak. And uh, so at the funeral, a lot, a lot, a lot of people came. And... Uh, so we were meeting them all, and this one man said to me, I'm from Orbis Books, and um, did you know that uh, Henry had a contract for this book called Adam, and uh, the contract is due in November, and he said there's a penalty if, if it isn't in. And I said, well, I, I don't know what to do about that, but I'll try to find out. So I went to Joe Egan, and Joe Egan said, great. He said, that's your responsibility because you're, you've been left his legacy, his, his written legacy. So you're responsible to get that book finished. Oh, my goodness. What a shock. <laughs> so this was like we were burying Henry. We, we hadn't even buried him yet. And uh, so I said to Robert, the publisher, I said, I, you know, I, I, I never done this before, and I don't know. I mean, you know. Anyway, uh, I said, I'll talk to you after the funeral and we'll, we'll talk about it. So that's what we did. And he said, if you can possibly finish it, because he said, we've already started advertising it. We already have people ordering it. And uh, he said, it would be a shame not to, not to put it out. 
So anyway, I took some time from daybreak and I went, I think, to our mother house and uh, just took some very quiet time. It was uh, it wasn't simple for me. It wasn't easy. First of all, because we had just lost Henry and uh, and we were still grieving Adam, although we were uh, you know we were at a distance from that. But these two people who really had a big part in my life and uh, so getting into this book was uh, I just had a lot of feeling and uh, I was trying to get my mind to go, but I kept sort of going under with my own feelings and everything. This That was the challenge for me, to, just to try to do it well. I had to visit his parents again, and we had to talk. They were wonderful and very, very kind. They're wonderful people. And um, so I had a lot of support, thankfully, which is the, the gift of Daybreak to me, and uh, was able to, to complete it. And uh, Robert, who is himself an editor, he, he's the head of the of the publishing company, uh, I just said to him, you have to take it from here and make any other changes, and I give you permission to do that. So anyway, he, t- he and I talked about some of the little details, but basically it was accepted and it went through, so that's how we did it. But it was a, it was a real challenge for me. But I, I love the book. It's, that's why when you ask me, there's no question it's my favorite book. I, I can't, it can't not be, because I love both those men. Oh, isn't that something? Well, I, you know, something you opened it afresh to me, and I really enjoyed reading it. I would encourage our our listeners to consider, if they've not read it before, to read Adam, God's Beloved. It's a beautiful, beautiful little book. So you have written other books. You're the author of, I have it here, A Place to Hold My Shaky Heart, Reflections for Life in Community, and that was in 1998. You also wrote My Brother, My Sister, in 1972 and I had that on my shelf long before I knew you by the way and then you wrote this lovely book Light Through the Crack Life After Loss and that was in 2006 you're a beautiful writer yourself and you have been you've you've taken on this enormous role of this beautiful literary legacy that Henry entrusted to you tell us a little bit about what that looked like for you when you I, I mean you it was a big burden. It wasn't. You said he's left me something. He really left you something, Sue. Tell us about that. Well, as I say, it was such a surprise. And I said, "What does it mean?" They said, "You're the literary executrix." And I said, "What does that mean?" I had no idea. So, again, I was sort of starting from scratch. But uh, I can't say that it was a horrible task because, you know, we had had ten years of. Uh, a relationship and I I felt that I knew a lot his mind and his heart and um, you know this Adam work which I had to do right after his death it taught I it's uh, it it was hard but uh, I was aware of this a profound relationship that developed between this very, very intelligent, fast-moving, uh, popular person and this man who sat in his wheelchair silent for his whole life. And I think that um, Henry Henry's relationship with Adam and how he describes that in the book tells us so much about uh, who he was and what he wanted to convey in all of his books, his thirst, his his deep inner uh, yearning for these things that seem to be outside our grasp or that seem to be titched with danger, but that somehow this relationship between these two very, very, very different men helped Henry to articulate um, uh, the movement or the formation or the the journey to accepting the yearning and allowing the love that is in front of us to be given to us and receiving it and allowing that to, to somehow give us some of what we need. I don't know if I'm saying this well at all, but I, 
I have to say that uh, reading this book, you, it's not something to be read quickly. Mm. It needs to be read slowly. And one has to realize that there's so much going on in Henry's mind and heart. And he's processing all of this because he himself can't understand that something so beautiful could happen to him, that he would be given someone who would teach him about his deepest longing and yearning and would help him to say yes, to have that not always fulfilled, but to rest with what is given. And um, so, yes, I the relationship uh, with with Adam was very, very special. And of course, maybe I had an influence on Henry, but he had a deep influence on me too. And I don't articulate those things well. I, I experience them, maybe not to the same uh, depth that Henry does, but I experience the yearning and the, the things that you that I have wanted in my life that, that are, as I say, are titched with danger. So do I go into it or do I not? Do I stay away from it? And for what reason? Mm. I think Henry has helped me to to live much, much more simply and to allow myself to experience the ups and downs and to find the wisdom of relationships and the and the satisfaction of the yearnings insofar as it's good for me and good for others. So I don't know. I'm not answering your question too well. Oh, no, I, 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 I just don't want you to stop. It's, it's very good. It's, it's, it's very deep, and I'm so grateful for who you are. You're 87 <laughs> years old. That gives you a certain uh, prestige. There's no doubt about it. You're... A woman uh, with a wonderful mind and a wonderful heart and a depth to you. Uh, the other thing I know about you, and I, I, I know I'm probably tiring you out. This will maybe be my last question. And it really is, I know you as a prayer warrior. And I came across this wonderful line this week. Raw power, the raw power of the kingdom is prayer. And I know that that's probably got more of your life now than ever. Maybe because COVID-19 has prevented going out and doing anything else. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about, about prayer and, and how you, what are you doing? What do you do with that? How do you pray? Hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard, isn't uh, it? <laughs> it is hard. It's a, it's, it's a discipline. And I am, I'm certainly not an expert, but I am trying to uh, just develop that as part of my life solitude listening uh reading inspirational material uh accompaniment with things that i want to live and do and pray about uh those are those are things that i've chosen as what i would call disciplines to live the life that i want to live so uh i in terms of prayer I, we have regular prayer in our congregation, which we say it's called the office of the, the, the church, and it's morning and evening uh, prayer. We, we gather at 5 o'clock in, in this house and say that office together, and I usually say the morning prayer myself. But um, I think just as I've approached my old age and my less energy uh, and also, I've retired from most of my responsibilities. I made a decision that I would really try to spend a little more time just quietly. And we have a lovely, tiny little chapel. And uh, so I can go there and give a couple of hours a day just, um, I think, trying to be close to the suffering in the world and trying to pray for people who are suffering. And I have a list of the people I tell God, these are the people that you've given me in my life, and so I'm giving them back to you today. And so I pray for people by name, lots of people every day, and groups of people, the the people who suffer. I pray for those groups, and uh, I have a miracle list that I, where I want. Jesus says, if you ask in my name, I'll do it for you. So I say, okay, you said that, so here I'm asking you. I want a miracle. I want my nephew to talk to his sister because they're they've been separated for a long time and i've prayed that prayer for quite a number of years and 
uh, one day I saw them together and I just about fell over. And I <laughs> asked him, I asked my nephew what happened. He said, I just called her up and said I was sorry. And so he said, it's so good. We're back together again. Oh. So oh. I've seen, when you see an answer like that, it's very encouraging. And so I have a whole list and I tell God every day you said it, so I'm saying it. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful, Sue. That is, that's wonderful. We could go on and on. I don't want to tire you out. I just want to ask one last question, and that is, for you, this is your favorite book by Henry Nowen. Is there anything that you would tell people in terms of why they should read it? What will they get from it if they read it? I, I think uh, anybody that's thoughtful about uh, living something that isn't just following the trend of society uh, probably is looking for material that would inspire them, not only in their minds, but also in their hearts. And I think this is a book, uh, you know, it's it's strange because in some ways I want to apologize for Henry, who is so confessional in this book. And he sounds like a wimp uh, because he talks about all the things that he struggles with. And he sounds like he was just a wimp. But actually, this guy had a lot together and a lot that wasn't so together. And uh, I think all of us can in some ways identify, maybe not with the same passion, but certainly in our inner and hidden lives, that this is a, this is a, a story for all of us. And I just remind us that you know, Jesus said, blessed are the poor. And most of us take that and say, oh, well, then I should run out and help those poor people. And that's the approach that most people have when they come to L'Arche. Well, I'm coming because I want to help people. But the transformation is that every person, even a person like Adam, who has absolutely no facility to speak or to move, or to act, or to do anything relevant, he has the power to touch us and to teach us something. He has a blessing for us. He has a gift for us. And I think this book is one book which describes that in a very, very beautiful way. If we don't get too caught in sort of the I don't know, the, the way Henry sort of throws everything at us, it's, it, that's why it has to be read slowly. And uh, there's so much in this book that is it possible that every person, that man that I pass on the street whose hair is all over his face and he's sitting there begging, and my tendency is to say, if I give him money, he'll buy a beer, and staying, instead of saying, this is my brother, and uh, I don't want to pass him by because he has a gift for me and I have a little gift for him. And I hope I can receive that gift. And I don't want him to suffer. So it's, 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 a, it's a deepening of our understanding of these things that I would say we live in our spirit, in our heart, in that place that nobody can operate on and see what's going on. Uh, but there's so much activity there. There's so much that we live there. There's so much desire and heart and love and hope and despair and uh, suffering and pain and wounds. Uh, this is all in each one of us. And somehow this book, I think, helps us to, to sort of sort that a little bit and to uh, find our path. Thank you, Sue. This, is, this has been a great treat. Just I... I can go on and on and on with you because there, there's there's story upon story, but this has been, this has just been good stuff, good stuff to the spirit. Thank you so much. You're and really I thank, welcome. I also thank Henry that he he said this is going to be the person who will be my executrix of my literary estate. You've watched over it well. You started the Henry Now and Legacy Trust, and you have placed that beautiful literary estate at the Kelly Library in the Henry J. M. Nowen Archives and Research Center. So there's it's a treasure that lives on and Henry Henry is loved more today, I think, than loved and understood more today probably than he was even in his lifetime. I think so. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. Thank you for listening to today's Now and Then podcast. 
Sister Sue Mosteller was so honest about the challenges Henry Nowen faced in his life, and honest about her own challenges. I hope this interview has been an encouragement for you. For more resources related to today's podcast, click on the links on the podcast page of our website. You'll find additional content, including the books we discussed today. As well, you'll find retreats and talks by Sister Sue Mosteller. If you enjoyed this podcast, we hope you'll give us a thumbs up or a good review, and we hope you'll share it with others. Thanks for listening. Until next time. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe, give us a thumbs up, or follow us on social media for more Henry Nouwen content. For books, videos, and other resources, or if you'd like to receive free daily Henry Nouwen e-meditations, you can follow the links below.